So short-term pain for long-term gain, as Tiff Macklin answers some of the criticism being sent his way. But what to make of this 50 basis point decision? How much higher might the rates go? To talk about this, we're reaching out right now to two economists. Armin Yalnizian is an economist and the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. Mustafa Askari is the Chief Economist with the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy. Hello to the two of you. Hello. Hi. How are you? Armin, I'm going to get you to start us out here. The bank did not introduce a 75 point basis hike as some had expected, instead a little lower. What do you make of that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know how to uh, get inside the head of Tiff Macklin or the hundreds of economists that helped him make that decision. But I can say that um, I do think 50 basis points looks like they blinked. Uh, And it looks like they uh, took a look at the uh, most recent data, Uh, the month-over-month, quarter-over-quarter data and said, maybe we've reached an inflection point. Yeah, there's some pain points still coming. And yeah, the economy is slowing. They are predicting a 50-50 chance for recession by the end of this year and the beginning of next year. So yeah, how much more tightening do you want to do? And they acknowledge in their report that there's a lot of pain coming down the pike for people that are covering debt costs right now. And don't forget, Canadians have got $2.3 trillion worth of debt. So the bill on that is quite high to uh, higher rates. It uh, does take a lot of money out of other purchasing power. So they were doing all of the due diligence in their report, as they must, as they do, uh, and uh you know, there's going to be some people that say it wasn't enough and other people that say it was too much. And maybe that's the, you know, Goldilocks spot you want to be in as the Bank of Canada governor. Yeah, Goldilocks, as you say. But, you know, Mustafa, we've been talking about today's uh, interest rate decision even before the day started. And that's in, in part because we've heard this past week uh, the federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh criticizing the bank for its increases. And if inflation, picking up on Mr. Singh's argument, if inflation is the result of supply shortages and Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, how does making Canadians pay higher interest rates address those inflationary pressures? couple of points on that. The bank cannot do anything about external factors. You know, that's obvious. You know, the oil prices will change or the war in Ukraine and all those other external factors would affect domestic prices and the bank cannot do anything about it. What the bank can do is they can do something about domestic demand. And that's the instrument that they have to interest rate to bring domestic demand down, especially at the time when we see that the supply has not been moving up and we have had this supply issue. So what they are trying to do is to bring demand down so that the supply can catch up with demand and that will reduce the pressure on, on, on prices. I think uh, the, the bank has a mandate. The mandate is to, to hold the inflation within one to three percent. Now for 30 years, they have been able to do that. Now because of the very unique situation of the pandemic and then the war in Ukraine, that has changed. And now, so what they have to do is they have to use their instru- the instrument that they have to, to bring inflation down. Now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be painful. It's going to be painful for especially lower, lower income Canadians. There is no doubt. But as the governor said today, there is no easy way out of this. You have to deal with it. If you don't deal with it now and allow this to, to, to continue, then you may have to do actually much more in the future. And that's what happened in the late 80s and early 90s when we ended up with, uh, you know, interest rate in the 20 percent range. So do we want that? Uh, you know, that would be really painful for, for a lot of people. So so I think th- they have to they have to do what they have to do. And I think that those kind of a comments of changing the mandate of the government, uh, the Bank of Canada, I don't think those are very helpful it's, Especially in the current context, because it could it could bring uncertainty into the into the independence of of the Bank of Canada. Okay, I mean, what would you say to that? Because you know, as we heard from Mustafa, the the the, the federal NDP leader is talking about changing the mandate of the Bank of Canada to include into in Mr. Singh's words uh, include full employment and the impact on employment. So, what would you say to that? Look, if you read the monetary policy report, you will see the full dashboard that they're watching uh, in terms of labor. 
And they are looking at what the maximum um, potential could be for labor. Virtually every central bank, whether they have an explicit dual mandate or not, is watching all the, li- the labor d- dashboard right now because we are in a very unusual period of labor shortages around the world because wherever there was a baby boom in the Second World War, those baby boomers are now retiring. So there's labor tightness everywhere and it will be lasting for the next five to 10 years. And the question is, is the economy overheating? That's the part that I find a little bit hard to stomach is there's excess demand because unemployment is low, it is at historic lows. Clearly that's not what the bank is saying, but I would agree with Mustafa that you don't have to bugger around with the uh, dual mandate. We just did a review of what its mandate should be. And I don't think you need to add full employment as the dual mandate. There is a country that does that, it's called the United States. And its chief concern is still price stability, as it should be here, too. That's the role of the central bank. You want something being done about poor uh, Canadians, about unemployment? We have other tools. The Bank of Canada is not the only actor in this story. We have fiscal tools at our uh, at our disposal, too. So, you know, what we're seeing is actually a realignment of what central banks do and what governments do. And that's the tension that we're seeing. You know, some uh, opposition critics will say you're doing too much. Others will say you're not doing enough. Uh, I think in this case, the uh, government of the day, the federal government of the day, needs to step up its game uh, to make sure that unemployment insurance benefits, EI, is recession ready. It is not. We lapsed back to pre-pandemic conditions at the end of September. I don't know why we didn't fix it, because we know a recession could be coming and we're not recession ready. We could be doing more to help people cover the costs of food or at least helping the sector that makes sure people don't go hungry. Same with the sector that makes sure that people uh, don't go with the house. There's lots that can be done from the fiscal side to offset the the necessary pain. But I agree completely with Mustafa that if the central bank does not stabilize prices, those same people we are worried about right now are going to be even harder hit down the road. And if you go back to the dirty 30s, the most progressive group in Canada's history wrote a manifesto and the very first thing they wanted for the people, the most populous group, was a, a central bank to stabilize prices. In an, in an environment where one in four Canadian, one in five Canadian is over the age of 65, we've got over a million people unemployed and a bunch of people on disability and on social assistance. These are the groups that are going to get hammered, absolutely hammered. And not to mention people that have a job full time, full year, but their wages are not keeping up with the price of basics like food. And the Bank of Canada, mm-hmm. to its credit, actually outlines that problem it doesn't say and the government has to do something about it but that's kind of the implication yeah, it's the, not their job yeah, the the implication that the monetary policy needs to also be accompanied with fiscal policy but you know the governor does right. say that we're nearing the end of these rate increases mustafa when will the increases stop where will the interest rate land before perhaps going back down well, I think by the end of November, we're going to see the uh, number, GDP numbers for the third quarter. And if we see a slowdown there, and the bank will look at the numbers at that time, they probably in the December uh, meeting, they're probably going to do another 25 basis point, and that will be probably the end of it. Unless something else happens externally that would, would allow uh, you know, oil prices again shoot up and then uh, the, the bank will have to take that into account at that point and, and deal with it. But very likely they are going to, to stop probably at the beginning of the next year, they're going to stop raising interest rates. Because by then, if they are right in their forecast, we are going to see either a negative growth in the first half of the year or very small positive growth in the first half of the next year. And if, if that is the case, then they really don't need to to raise interest rate anymore because it it shows that the economy is actually going slowly going down and the demand is getting closer to supply and that's that's what they they want to see okay i mean what do you think when will these increases stop where will it actually land at i i'm not as confident as mustafa because i think it is possible to be in a recessionary condition and still have escalating food prices and gas prices then what does the central bank do we already know that bank rate hikes don't do anything about gas prices or food prices these are the two and shelter costs are 
far more in, amenable to interest domestic interest rate hikes. But all over the world, central banks are moving in lockstep to tame inflation. And it's like, there's elements of inflation you can tame, and there are elements of inflation you cannot tame with raising uh, bank rates. And those are the ones that are actually the most problematic for the population is rising food prices and rising gas prices. Over, you know, we're expecting to see food prices moderate a little bit because we're going to get a bumper crop, sorry, bumper crop in yields this year, at least in Canada. But things like Hurricane Ian, Hurricane Fiona has meant a real crash in produce that's exported to us over the winter uh, months. Uh, we are going to be seeing the p- potential for commodities like flour um, and uh, cooking oils also escalate in cost. They're the biggest drivers within CPI right now in the food lines. These are the absolute basics that you get at food banks. And if those prices are rising, there's nothing. I, that's going to be an even harder tightrope for the Bank of Canada to stand back and say, we can't do anything about it. Your job is to do something about it. But everybody acknowledges this isn't about excess demand. It's about inadequate supply. And sure, you can cool demand to try and let supply catch up to it. But what happens if that doesn't happen in the coming months? I think we're in for a very rough ride this fall. Okay. Well, with those encouraging words, <laughs> Armin, Mustafa, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. It was a pleasure. Thank you.